The Last Resort Inn Incident by Andre Michael Petrocek. Never argue with stupid people. They will drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. A quote by Mark Twain. Two winters ago, Glary's, our faithful tabaxi, had made her inheritance from waitress to the owner of the inn. Her inn, the trade post, and a militia chapter of the rangers made up the entire little outpost. Cozy, now that most monsters had been neutralized, beloved and lucrative, as good aligned ex-adventurers deserve it. Last year's greatest drama was a cooking festival, hosted by gnomes going awry and an unexpected lack of supplies. Luckily, the halfling rangers were so loyal that they skipped their third breakfast for the entire winter and added only one late night meal to the regular five meals per day. Gluttony, a goddess. This year, I knew it was different because Glary's contacted me using clerical magic. Such is not easily done for fun, so an emergency must have occurred. Aged, but not callous, I prepared to aid my former comrade in arms, starting by alerting other former members of our venturing team. Me. Yes, indeed. I had forgotten my manners once again, as if reading my aura and looking at my quite formidable arcane robe and staff would not already do that for me. I am Lucario Oakstaff Pretzlau, an aging human, small town wizard with a handful of graduations in arcane circles and seminars. While I would never consider myself a master wizard, I did spend 25 years of my life as an adventuring aka wandering wizard and another 25 years trying to recover and survive a while longer. Tragically undone when clashed with a creature not even supposed to still exist. A larkin spawn, swamp creatures continuously devouring the magic out of any life form known if one does not flee. Blessed survivor of the assault as I was neither alone nor an ill-prepared bookworm type of person. Tactical withdrawal, years of wandering had kept my muscles in mediocre shape. Not that I could compete with a ranger, a monk, or fighters, but I had learned from each of them. Still, my power was wrecked, drained. Where was I? Ah, I am Lucario Oakstaff Pretzlau and for a swift journey across the realm, I contacted former companions, so not to travel alone. It is always proven wise to stay wary of criminals, and even wiser to never travel ill-prepared. And while I can no longer just teleport us across the realm, I still knew solitary wizards, some rare warlocks and colleagues, and academies worth asking for help. Hence I gathered two more adventurers who owed Glary's the kind of favor that makes aging Rex once more risk clashing with dangerous evil. Bards earn more with such tales I know. I felt relieved when Gerwin Shadowstomper, a dwarven thief unbelievably fond of his family belonging to a dwarven house that went from underground to living in the forest willingly, joined in. Rogues are a vigilant sort, and a hill dwarf companion is a good safeguard against the criminal foul play non-magic users tend to muster. Our third companion was a surprise, as Melissa Paladina of the Sacred Shield, an order of knightly wardens, started her wandering years. This means she had earned the privilege of leaving the cloistered walls of the order by graduation and dutiful service for at least one year. A real knighted paladin woman. Rain resistant traveler clothing for me, armors and shields for Melissa, and the leather on Mithril only a dwarf like Gorin could consider body armor. 
food rations, water flasks, and filters so we could drink river water without falling sick. The little yet wise efforts learned on a hundred ordeals before. With a travel preparation and group gathering done within only eight hours, I was decently happy. If it would not have been under the pressure of time, then a full group of at least six adventures would have been formed. But I was glad that payment was not part of this. We three boarded a small ship, sailed west one harbor in distance, and then failed to find horses. So I did an incantation of swift movement on each of our boots and shoes. Moving faster than most rangers could, we made our way to the inn, named the Last Resort, Glary's new homestead. Some beast howled in the night, but the overall assessment of danger was wonderfully absent. After a short sleep in the forest, we used the early morning light to reach our destination awestruck as the outpost had been worked into a walled little village by now craftsmen work done during the last year impressive age and pain take some toll on my ability to concentrate so the stars i saw when entering the inn resulted in a slightly less well-trained glaries hugging me nearly senseless are mentioned a bit tired but still the tabaxi woman I remembered. Life was hard for her, but it was work she did for herself now. Glary still wore her holy symbol, was clad in a chainmail shirt, tank top style, yet mithril metal, and had studded leather bracers protecting arms and legs. Not half the real cleric armor, still far from being naive about the new job excluding what we had faced so often before. An intense hour cut short, as we had mostly personal issues to debate. Glaries had sensed a change in the inn's atmosphere. She had checked it with her magical senses, and found something odd, vaguely toxic, opposing her investigation. Soon thereafter, nightmares haunted whoever slept in the inn. The emanations of evil, depravity, or the presence of undead in the vicinity can trigger such nightmares. Nightmares which are a burden to some, but also a warning sign to watch out for, as they are grossly different from childhood bad dreams. Gorin inquired about Dwarven Ale, but I was happy to realize, after just a moment of eavesdropping, that Gorin meant to deliver Dwarven Ale to the last resort. Yes, dwarves are good in business, and Dwarven Ale was even legal. Always a pleasure when the thief is disciplined and cautious enough, kinda. Melissa followed her routine procedure, as trained paladins would not even freak out about evil detected. She assessed the rooms and the frequenters of the inn with her divine scrutiny, but did not mention any concern to either me or to Gorin or Glaries. In my experience, People of the faith are stronger when not alone. Could be wishful thinking or an older man's nostalgia. Yet I think, Glaries and Melissa seem to get along well. No heated debates about different deities and the kind of gentle but formal I knew from so many women in the past. Good enough. We made a quick plan as we were impaired by the routine having to go on. So far, no danger would justify evacuating the inn. We ate in the kitchen, and once the guests were served, we ventured upstairs to use magical detection, physical tracking, and whatever dwarven villainy offered. After four incantations, I felt a minor headache arising, and the first signs of fatigue made it harder for me to concentrate. Still, I finished all six of my prepared magical detection routines as I wanted to do my part in making sure our rooms would be safe and the trouble zone would be thoroughly investigated. There was a baleful, clearly magical presence, but not the form a person like a typical tiefling sorcerer or a spell or ritual would leave behind. 
No surprise as the occurrence covered an area, at minimum one floor of the inn, and thereby threatened the entire outpost. I helped buy us time to rest as I used my magic to counter the magic we had detected. Weakening it temporarily would not solve the problem, but it allowed us a safer rest to be in shape for undoing it best we could. Gorin mumbled about a bad feeling too. Bad news to us, sense of foreboding. They will tell you that arcane formula is trusted and established for a reason. True, still I tell you, not one of those bookworms has survived a single assault by real monsters and real villains. Hence, there is a smarter way called adapting your staff enchantments to your way of life, not some ancient tombs boasting. While it was not my first night in clothing, Keeping my staff in my hands, I still wondered how much harder such must be when wearing metal armor, a shield, and larger weapons of the martial sorts. Gorin and Melissa, much like Glary's, never really complained about it. Still, sometimes it showed to impair movement nonetheless. There are magical efforts, be they arcane or divine, in their origins which immediately make living folks aware of them. One such occurred after midnight, and in retrospect, I know that only I was instant awake when it happened. The upper floor of the last resort had six guest rooms. While not Spartan, like monk cells, each was at best made for two persons. By design, all rooms had vaguely the same structure and interior. Typical little hotel rooms, one could say in big city words, but something was wrong, very wrong. Glary's was already rushing up the stairs as faithfully unafraid. She had continued to work and sleep in a room below. Gorin and Melissa were in the corridor, weapons in their hands. One look and we reassured each other that we had the same bad feeling. The three guests supposedly there with us did not answer when we knocked on their doors. After Glary's used the master key and Gorin opened another door to save us time, we found them gone. Gone as in vanished, abducted, snatched away, for the window showed no sign of acrobatic escape nor sleep wandering. That magic is still tucking at me. Can you feel it too? I asked. Agreement from all three swiftly followed, and due to Gorin, I could be sure it was not just the awareness trained spellcasters share when strange magic is around. The magic was made to tuck, for whatever purpose. Dreamlike shifts in our perceptions occurred, or better said, what we mistook to be dreamy were in fact emanations of someone attempting to meddle with the reality of our surroundings. Instead of waiting dumbstruck, I shielded my team with the kind of spells we wizards use to absorb magic missiles. What happened next is hard to describe, as we were simply ripped away from where we stood, ripped away forcefully by an unknown magic now specifically targeting us four. We awoke in a cavern, a feeling of dread with us, but not immediately urgent. Chants could be heard, syllables of incantations. Contemplating every bit of wizardry I could remember, I concluded that those spellcasters I named cultists had directed the baleful energy to prevent us from ending it. With lives at stake that was malevolent enough to consider militant resistance, the risk of harm by trying to knock them unconscious only seemed too great. It was, as later learned, our five opponents fought, albeit disturbed during their ritual, and we won only by the clerical magic healing the wounds we suffered. Gorin, as swift as his blend of rapier and dwarven warhammer went, was still too slow to reach a second opponent after finishing his first one off. I see no heroism in it, but justified protection of the community. 
We killed five cultists, who probably were homicidal maniacs, and who did use black magic against each of us and others. Sadly, only bardic tales end with a celebration. Cultists often serve a more formidable power, called a higher power, albeit the lower hells are the most common source. Once we had ended the ritual, we were no longer targets, but that was it. That alone did not end the threat, hence we continued our investigation. As noted, after Melissa and Glaries had prayed for healing, which is a lifesaver we thank the gods for, using magical senses we found the hellhole, call it portal, and delivered the weird energy, and being too wise to consider me or our team greater heroic powers, we kept it simple. Melissa and Glaries coordinated their prayers with my incantations, the clerical magic aiming to turn anything contaminated by evil back into natural, at best into sacred, and my ability to undo magical effects focused on weakening the baleful portal's resistance. The final struggle, and at least we scored a temporal success. Mightier wizards may indeed curse my name, but my task was to support Glaries, and reporting to the local constabulary and alerting temples and arcane colleagues would still be done in the weeks to follow. That struggle never ends, and being limited does not imply that we did not act dutiful and sane. The cult must be found, as knowledge of using such magic is certainly not in books for starter students. The energy must be identified, so to go proper threat assessment. Finally, the influence of evil outsiders must be thwarted, as the mere thought is worse than nightmares, literally. And as written by me, we sat in bathtubs, shaking and hurting. Our greatest longing was being alone and comfy in our beds. Rest and recovery. No sex orgy to celebrate that we were still alive. No gold dished and no cheering commoners. Nor any promotions on the job. We just did the right thing. The best we could. The end.